Hi, welcome to the Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class, sponsored by the Hurricane Utah North Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I'm Mike Parker, and since 2008, it's been my privilege to be the instructor for this class. The Hurricane Utah Adult Religion Class meets on Thursday evenings between September and May to discuss the scriptures, teachings, and history of the restored Church of Jesus Christ. If you live in or are visiting the Hurricane St. George area, I'd love to have you join us. Time and location are available on the class website. There's a link to that in the show notes just below this video. Also on the class website, you can download my notes, which includes footnotes documenting my sources, this PowerPoint presentation, and handouts that I distribute in class. Please note that this YouTube channel and the class website are not official sites of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the Hurricane Utah North Stake, or any other church unit or department. I alone am responsible for the content on these sites. What you're about to see is a recording of my notes for one of the lessons. If you enjoy this video, please click the like button and share it with a friend. And please feel free to subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new content is posted to this channel. My friends, the gospel of Jesus Christ is true. Joseph Smith was a prophet of God, and the authority and keys that he held are now vested in the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And most importantly, Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. I hope you enjoy this lesson. In this lesson, we'll be discussing the doctrine of agency and the Lamanite mission that brought the restored gospel to the Kirtland, Ohio region. We'll be covering Doctrine and Covenants sections 29 to 34. At the end of the last lesson, I reviewed a revelation Joseph Smith received just before the Conference of the Church that was held on the 26th of September, 1830 in Fayette, New York. This revelation, now canonized as section 28 of our Doctrine and Covenants, corrected Hiram Page's error and called Oliver Cowdery on a mission. Joseph Smith received several more revelations around the time of this conference. These revelations, now canonized as sections 29 to 34, are the focus of this lesson. Joseph Smith received the revelation that is now section 29, just prior to the September 1830 church conference. He dictated it in the presence of six elders of the church and three members. This was the first of Joseph's revelations that considered at length the events of the last days leading up to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph received several other revelations that cover that same subject. I've grouped all of them into the upcoming lesson 11, so we'll defer our discussion of section 29's end times material until then. This is the first revelation Joseph Smith received regarding the principle of agency. DNC 29 verses 34 to 40, quote, Wherefore, verily I say unto you that all things unto me are spiritual, and not at any time have I given unto you a law which was temporal, neither any man, nor the children of men, neither Adam your father, whom I created. Behold, I gave unto him, Adam, that he should be an agent unto himself, and I gave unto him commandment, but no temporal commandment gave I unto him, for my commandments are spiritual. They are not natural, nor temporal, neither carnal, nor sensual. And it came to pass that Adam, being tempted of the devil, for behold, the devil was before Adam, for he rebelled against me, saying, Give me thine honor, which is my power. And also a third part of the hosts of heaven turned he away from me because of their agency, and they were thrust down. And thus came the devil and his angels. And behold, there was a place prepared for them from the beginning, which place is hell. And it must needs be that the devil should tempt the children of men, or they could not be agents unto themselves. For if they never should have bitter, they could not know the sweet. Wherefore it came to pass that the devil tempted Adam and he partook of the forbidden fruit and transgressed the commandment, wherein he became subject to the will of the devil, because he yielded unto temptation." Unquote. 
The entire train of thought runs from verse 22 to the end of the Revelation, verse 50. But this portion contains the principal idea that I'd like to focus on. Before we can understand the principle of agency, we first must understand that God never gives his children temporal laws, those that pertain to this life or this world or the body only, or are measured or limited by time. God's laws are all spiritual. They are eternal and designed to exalt us and bring us back into his presence. The things we do as part of church service, delivering a meal to a sick member, mowing a widow's lawn, cleaning the ward meeting house, etc. These may appear to be temporal acts, but they are all designed to bless others and thereby ultimately exalt us. As a newly called apostle, Dallin H. Oaks applied this principle to the pioneers who came to Utah. Quote, the Latter-day Saint men and women who settled these valleys of the mountains acted upon the principle of spiritual interpretation and understanding. Judged in terms of the values and aspirations of the world, some pioneer enterprises were failures. The iron mission did not succeed in making significant quantities of iron. The cotton mission did not give the Utah Territory self-sufficiency in cotton production. Efforts to manufacture sugar did not achieve material success for 40 years. The Perpetual Immigration Fund did not perpetuate itself because many immigrants were unable to pay their debt to it. But when measured against the eternal values of loyalty, cooperation, and consecration, some of the most conspicuous worldly failures are seen as the pioneer enterprisers greatest triumphs. Whatever their financial outcome, these enterprises called forth the sacrifices that molded pioneers into saints and prepared saints for exaltation." Unquote. The section 29 revelation was received about the same time that chapter 4 of the book of Moses was produced as part of Joseph's new translation of the Bible. The opening passage of that chapter contains additional details on the agency of man and Satan's desire to destroy it. Moses 4, verses 1 through 4, quote, And I, the Lord God, spake unto Moses, saying, That Satan, whom thou hast commanded in the name of mine only begotten, is the same which was from the beginning. And he came before me, saying, Behold, here am I, send me, and I will be thy son, and I will redeem all mankind, that one soul shall not be lost, and surely I will do it. Wherefore, give me thine honor. But behold, my beloved son, who was my beloved and chosen from the beginning, said unto me, Father, thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. Wherefore, because that Satan rebelled against me and sought to destroy the agency of man, which I, the Lord God, had given him, and also that I should give unto him mine own power, by the power of mine only begotten, I caused that he should be cast down, and he became Satan, yea, even the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men, and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto my voice." Unquote. Verses 1 and 3 explain that Satan was cast down for three reasons. These reasons are, one, because he rebelled against the Lord God, two, because he sought to destroy the agency of man. Three, because he sought to have the honor and power of the Lord God. These three principles are also mentioned in verse 36 of section 29. The principle of agency is central to the Father's plan of salvation. From the beginning, Satan's objective has been to destroy or overturn man's agency. In a moment, we'll discuss how he attempts to do that. Returning to section 29, verses 35 and 39, quote, I gave unto Adam that he should be an agent unto himself, and it must needs be that the devil should tempt the children of men, or they could not be agents unto themselves, unquote. Let's define terms. Latter-day Saints often mistakenly use the term free agency. Elder Boyd K. Packer taught, Quote, the phrase free agency does not appear in scripture. The only agency spoken of there is moral agency, which the Lord said, 
I have given unto him, that every man may be accountable for his own sins in the day of judgment." Unquote. There is also a common misunderstanding among the saints that agency refers to free will or the freedom to make choices. Free will is a component of agency, but there's more to agency than just free will. In his 1828 Dictionary of American English, Noah Webster defined agency as, quote, one, the quality of moving or of exerting power, the state of being in action, action, operation, instrumentality, and two, the office of an agent or factor, business of an agent entrusted with the concerns of another." Unquote. Webster's first definition indicates the power and ability to act. This is similar to the Book of Mormon prophet Lehi's division of God's creation into things which act and things which are acted upon. 2 Nephi 2, verses 26 and 27, quote, And the Messiah cometh in the fullness of time, that he may redeem the children of men from the fall. And because that they are redeemed from the fall, they have become free forever, knowing good from evil, to act for themselves and not to be acted upon, save it be by the punishment of the law at the great and last day, according to the commandments which God hath given. Wherefore, men are free according to the flesh and all things are given unto them which are expedient unto man. And they are free to choose liberty and eternal life through the mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. For he seeketh that all men might be miserable like unto himself." Unquote. According to Lehi, our ability to act freely is a gift from God that we possess because of the redemption carried out by Jesus Christ. Because we are capable of action, we are agents unto ourselves, and therefore free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. Webster's second definition of agency refers to the ability of a person to function as an agent, one who is entrusted with the business of another. This is the concept of stewardship, in which God delegates to us certain powers and responsibilities and then holds us accountable for our actions in discharging them. This principle is explained in DNC 64, verse 29, quote, Wherefore, as ye are agents, ye are on the Lord's errand, and whatever ye do according to the will of the Lord is the Lord's business, unquote. To be an agent, therefore, is to be entrusted with the Lord's business and to be accountable to him for how one carries it out. According to Moses 7, verse 32, after showing the prophet Enoch a vision of the inhabitants of the earth, quote, the Lord said unto Enoch, behold, these thy brethren, they are the workmanship of mine own hands. And I gave unto them their knowledge in the day I created them. And in the garden of Eden gave I unto man his agency, unquote. When God placed man and woman in Eden, he gave them agency, dominion over the earth, and the responsibility to act as his agents in the way they used its resources, with the promise that they would be accountable for their actions. As their descendants, we too have this responsibility and will be held accountable by God for our actions. DNC 104, verses 17 and 18, quote, for the earth is full, and there is enough and to spare. Yea, I prepared all things, and have given unto the children of men to be agents unto themselves. Therefore, if any man shall take of the abundance which I have made, and impart not his portion according to the law of my gospel unto the poor and the needy, he shall, with the wicked, lift up his eyes in hell, being in torment." Unquote. Once we understand that agency includes stewardship and accountability, the passage from Moses chapter 4 that we read earlier becomes clearer. Satan sought to destroy the agency of man before the world was created. Satan didn't try to take away our ability to act, Webster's first definition of agency. He tried to take away any responsibility and accountability we would have for our actions, 
Webster's second definition of agency. Under Satan's plan, we wouldn't have been forced to obey. Rather, he proposed that we should be free of any accountability, responsibility, or consequences. Under his plan, we would have been saved no matter what we did. I will redeem all mankind, that one soul shall not be lost, he promised. That's how he sought to destroy the agency of man. In summary, agency is not simply free will. It refers to men and women acting as the Lord's agents, having been given stewardship in his kingdom and over the things of the earth, having the power to act, and being accountable to him for our actions. This passage from the end of section 29 is also connected to the principle of agency. DNC 29, verses 46 and 47, quote, But behold, I say unto you, that little children are redeemed from the foundation of the world through mine only begotten. Wherefore, they cannot sin. For power is not given unto Satan to tempt little children until they begin to become accountable before me. Unquote. Because Satan does not have the power to tempt little children, they are not moral agents. They are therefore incapable of sinning and are not responsible for their actions until they reach a level of maturity and reasoning where they can choose right from wrong. The prophet Mormon taught that little children are alive in Christ and therefore have no need of repentance. Their actions, which would otherwise be sinful if committed by persons who had agency, are covered by the atonement of Christ. This is a matter that is also addressed in section 68, which we'll cover in a future lesson. Let's turn next to the missionary efforts of the early church. The revelations in sections 30 to 34 are largely about missionary work and commandments to early Mormon missionaries. Samuel H. Smith, brother of the prophet Joseph, was the first missionary of the restored church. Samuel was one of the eight witnesses of the Book of Mormon and one of the six founding members of the church. He was ordained an elder by Oliver Cowdery at the church conference held at Fayette, New York on the 9th of June, 1830. Samuel was set apart as a missionary by his brother Joseph, and on the 30th of June, 1830, he filled his knapsack with copies of the Book of Mormon and traveled through the neighboring towns in upstate New York to introduce people to the newly published Book of Scripture. He traveled over 30 miles, or 48 kilometers, on the first day. His message was forcefully rejected five times. Toward the end of the day, seeing an apple tree a short distance from the road, he concluded to pass the night under it, and here he lay all night upon the cold, damp ground. During his first mission, Samuel sold a copy of the Book of Mormon to Phineas H. Young of Menden, New York. Phineas read the book and was baptized in April 1832. Phineas's copy of the Book of Mormon came into the hands of his younger brother, Brigham. This, in conjunction with additional contacts, led to Brigham Young's conversion to the restored gospel and baptism in April 1832. Samuel's mission also led to the baptism of Heber C. Kimball, who was later called as an apostle, served in the first apostolic mission to Great Britain, and became a counselor to Brigham Young in the First Presidency. Samuel Smith's first mission lasted 15 months, during which he traveled over 4,000 miles, or 6,400 kilometers, preaching from Maine to Missouri. Other early missionaries included Joseph Smith Sr. and Don Carlos Smith, the prophet's father and brother, who shared a copy of the Book of Mormon with relatives in St. Lawrence County, New York. Hiram Smith, the prophet's brother, who served a mission in the areas of Palmyra, Fayette, and Colesville, New York and Jared Carter, who preached in Ohio, New York, Vermont, and Pennsylvania. After the September 1830 conference of the church, John Whitmer was called by revelation to, quote, proclaim my gospel as with the voice of a trump, unquote, at the home of Philip Burroughs in nearby Seneca Falls, New York, and in that region roundabout. The prophet Joseph also received a revelation after the conference, directing the newly baptized Thomas B. Marsh to declare the things which have been revealed to my servant Joseph Smith Jr. and to preach from this time forth. March preached in Massachusetts. Solomon Chamberlain, 
was the first missionary to Canada. One of the earliest and most ambitious missionary endeavors commenced in October 1830 with the call of four men to preach to American Indian tribes. At the conclusion of the last lesson, I mentioned that Oliver Cowdery was directed by revelation to leave after the September 1830 conference to preach unto the Lamanites, and that the city of Zion would be built on the borders near the Lamanites, where he would preach. Two other revelations in this week's reading contain calls to three other men who were to join Oliver, Peter Whitmer Jr., Parley P. Pratt, and Ziva Peterson. We've previously dis discussed Oliver Cowdery and Peter Whitmer Jr. Let's get acquainted with the other two men. Ziba Peterson was baptized on 18th of April, 1830 by Oliver Cowdery. On 9th of June, 1830, he was one of five elders ordained at the first conference of the church, bringing the total number of elders to seven. Parley Parker Pratt's story is one of the most inspiring in church history. After an early life of unsuccessful farming in New York, he moved west in 1823 and settled in Northeast Ohio in 1826, where his farm prospered. In 1829, he became a follower of the Reformed Baptist Church, later called Disciples of Christ or Campbellites. He strongly felt that he was called upon by the Holy Ghost to forsake his house and home for the gospel's sake. So he sold his Ohio farm and with only $10 in his pocket, set out to preach the gospel in August, 1830. While journeying through western New York along the Erie Canal, he felt compelled to leave his wife on the boat and travel into the countryside to preach. In his autobiography, he wrote that it was on that journey that he was introduced to, quote, an old Baptist deacon by the name of Hamlin. After hearing of our appointment for evening, he began to tell of a book, a strange book, a very strange book in his possession, which had been just published. This book, he said, purported to have been originally written on plates either of gold or brass by a branch of the tribes of Israel, and to have been discovered and translated by a young man near Palmyra in the state of New York by the aid of visions or the ministry of angels. I inquired of him how or where the book was to be obtained. He promised me the perusal of it at his house the next day if I would call. I felt a strange interest in the, the book. Next morning, I called at his house where, for the first time, my eyes beheld the Book of Mormon, that book of books, that record, which was the principal means in the hands of God of directing the entire course of my future life. I opened it with eagerness and read its title page. I then read the testimony of several witnesses in relation to the manner of its being found and translated. After this, I commenced its contents by course. I read all day. Eating was a burden. I had no desire for food. Sleep was a burden when the night came, for I preferred reading to sleep. As I read, the Spirit of the Lord was upon me, and I knew and comprehended that the book was true, as plainly and manifestly as a man comprehends and knows that he exists. My joy was now full, as it were, and I rejoiced sufficiently to more than pay me for all the sorrows, sacrifices, and toils of my life. This discovery greatly enlarged my heart and filled my soul with joy and gladness. I esteemed the book, or the information contained in it, more than all the riches of the world. Yes, I verily believe that I would not at that time have exchanged the knowledge I then possessed for a legal title to all the beautiful farms, houses, villages, and property which passed in my review before me on my journey through one of the most flourishing settlements of Western New York." Unquote. Parley went immediately to Palmyra, New York to find Joseph Smith. Joseph was living in Harmony, Pennsylvania at that time, but Parley met Hiram at the Smith family home, and the two spent all night conversing about the restored gospel. Together they traveled to the Whitmer farm in Fayette, New York. Parley was baptized on the 1st of September, 1830, by Oliver Cowdery in Seneca Lake and ordained an elder. He then converted and baptized his brother, Orson. Parley finally met the prophet Joseph in Fayette at the conference of the church held on the 26th of September, 1830. 
As a matter of interest here in Hurricane, Utah, two decades later, Parley was the leader of the 1849 expedition commissioned by Brigham Young to explore Southwest Utah to see if the area could be colonized. His group first crossed the Virgin River at the north end of what is now Hurricane, where North Main Street dead ends at the River Gorge. A historical marker has been placed there commemorating the expedition. Parley Pratt was one of the great missionaries, writers, and apostles of the restored church, and he gave his life in 1857 as a martyr for the gospel's sake. Let's take a moment to review the historical background of the Lamanite mission. In 1830, the United States federal government began to forcibly remove Native American tribes in the eastern states to Indian Territory west of Missouri in modern-day Nebraska, Kansas, and Oklahoma. Oliver Cowdery was commanded by revelation to travel to the borders by the Lamanites, which was the western border of the state of Missouri. He and his companions set out for the town of Independence, Missouri, the last American outpost before entering Indian Territory. The four missionaries left Fayette, New York on 18th of October, 1830. As they traveled, they preached along the way to both white settlers and Native Americans. Their first stop was just south of Buffalo, New York, where they taught the Cataragus Indians and gave them two copies of the Book of Mormon. By the end of October, 1830, they had reached Northeastern Ohio. While preaching in this area, they contacted Parley Pratt's friend and former pastor, Sidney Rigdon. Rigdon was a leading figure in the Reformed Baptist movement, a group that believed in the need for a restoration of the ancient Christian church. Rigdon's beliefs were similar to those of Alexander Campbell's Disciples of Christ movement. Reformed Baptists believed that all existing churches were in error and that the Christian creeds were of human, not biblical origin. This spirit of restoration in early America prepared many people to receive the restored gospel once it was preached to them. Sidney Rigdon read the Book of Mormon and was convinced of its truth. He was baptized on 14th November, 1830 by Oliver Cowdery. Many members of his Reformed Baptist congregation followed him and joined the restored Church of Christ. During the four weeks the missionaries spent in Northeastern Ohio, they baptized approximately 130 converts, 50 of them from the town of Kirtland. These new converts made Kirtland the center of their branch of the church. Among these converts were men who would become leaders in the restored church, including Frederick G. Williams, Lyman White, Newell K. Whitney, Levi Hancock, and John Murdoch. Edward Partridge and Orson Hyde also joined the church soon after the missionaries departed in late November 1830. By the end of December 1830, church membership in Ohio had reached 300 persons, nearly three times the number of members in New York State. Kirtland convert Frederick G. Williams joined the missionaries, and they continued southwest. They visited the Wendat Indians at Sandusky, Ohio, where their message received an enthusiastic response. They were unable to interest anyone in Cincinnati. In late December, they took passage down the Ohio River from Cincinnati. They intended to travel up the Mississippi River to St. Louis, but they encountered river ice near Cairo, Illinois, and were forced to walk overland. From St. Louis, their journey became increasingly arduous as they encountered some of the most severe snowstorms on record. Food was scarce, and they were forced to survive on meager rations of frozen bread and pork. In late January, 1831, still battling exceptionally cold temperatures, the missionaries arrived at Jackson County, Missouri. They had traveled 1,500 miles, or 2,400 kilometers, mostly on foot, with the latter portion of their journey taking place in midwinter. The town of Independence was the Wild West of its day. It was a rough and undisciplined frontier village where people went to get away from it all, especially if it all included the law. The town was only 12 miles, about 19 kilometers, from the western border between the United States and Indian Territory. This made it ideal as a place to stay while preaching to the Indian tribes. Peter Whitmer and Ziva Peterson set up a tailor shop to earn money to support the missionary effort, while Oliver Cowdery, 
Parley P. Pratt, and Frederick G. Williams crossed the border into Indian Territory. They began teaching a tribe of Delaware, or Lenape Indians, who quickly began to feel a spirit of inquiry and excitement about the Book of Mormon. The missionaries made plans to establish a permanent school among the Delawares and to baptize converts. They were stopped, though, by an order to desist issued by the U.S. Federal Indian agent, Richard W. Cummins. After issuing the missionaries a second warning, Cummins threatened to arrest them if they did not leave Indian lands. Parley Pratt believed that the order was motivated by, quote, the jealousy of the Indian agents and sectarian missionaries, unquote, in independence. There was an established Methodist mission near the Delaware villages. This may have been the sectarian missionaries Parley referred to. Agent Cummins claimed that the missionaries did not possess a certificate authorizing their presence on government-managed Indian lands. Cowdery wrote to Cummins' superintendent requesting a license to return to Indian lands, but the request was never granted. This effectively ended the Lamanite mission. Oliver Cowdery dispatched Parley Pratt back to Ohio and New York to report on the status of the mission to church leaders. The other four missionaries remained in independence and preached to white settlers in Jackson County with some success. Four months later, in June 1831, Joseph Smith himself came to Jackson County to meet the missionaries. During his visit, the prophet received a revelation identifying a site a half mile or 0.8 kilometers from the independence courthouse as the temple lot for the New Jerusalem. We'll discuss this in Lesson 13. The Lamanite mission to Western Missouri in 1830 and 1831 was important for at least three reasons. First, it demonstrated the church's commitment to preach to the descendants of the Lamanites of the Book of Mormon, a commitment which continues to this day and has led to the conversion of tens of millions of people in North and South America. Second, it established Kirtland, Ohio as a fruitful source of new converts to the restored gospel. Kirtland soon became the headquarters for the church. We'll discuss this in the next lesson. Third, it ultimately brought Joseph Smith to Jackson County, Missouri to lay the foundation of Zion, the New Jerusalem. Like many of the church's other supposed failed endeavors, the Lamanite mission had unexpected and fortuitous side effects that benefited the church and helped grow the kingdom of God on earth. That concludes this lesson. If you enjoyed it, please click the thumbs up button and leave a comment below. Please subscribe if you'd like to be notified when new lessons are posted to this channel and visit www.huarc.org to download these notes and this slideshow. Next Thursday is Halloween this year, so we'll be taking the week off. When we return in two weeks, we'll discuss the doctrine of Zion and the commandment given to the saints to gather to Zion. The reading is Doctrine and Covenants, sections 35 to 40 and 47. See you next week.